esta ocasión nos acompaña el doctor John Clay. Eh, voy a leer su, su semblanza. Eh, John Clay es emeritus profesor at Simon Fraser University. He was educated at Occidental College, Bachelor, at the University of California, Berkeley, Master, and the University of British Columbia, PhD. Clage was a uh, work as a research scientist with the Geological Survey of Canada from 1975 until 1998. In 1998, he accepted a faculty position in the part of Earth Sciences at Simon Fraser University. He is currently director of the Center for Natural Hazard Research at SHU. Clege is a fellow of Royal Society of Canada, former president of the Geological Association of Canada, a past president of the International Union for Quaternary Research at the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of British Columbia. He is recipient of the Geological Society of America Burwell Award the Royal Society of Canada Bancroft Award, APE GBC's Innovation Editorial Board Award, and the Geological Association of Canada's ARWB Nils Medals and JGAC's Logan Medal and Ambrose Medal. He was the 2007 and 2008 Richard Young's Distinguished Lecture for the Geological Society of American and Association of Environmental and Engineer Geological, and received an honoris PhD from the University of Waterloo in 2017. Le damos la bienvenida al Dr. Clark. Muchas gracias. Y uh, gracias por la invitación a visitar uh, a México y UNAM. Uh, me complace tener esta oportunidad de presentar investigaciones que yo y mis colegas uh, hemos hecho sobre los peligros de los terremotos en la oeste de Canadá. And unfortunately, that's the only Spanish I'm going to be speaking. <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, I have graphics that uh, will help, I think, explain my story. Um, this is the outline of my presentation. I'm going to start out with a few slides that outline earthquake, uh, important earthquake uh, concepts. Uh, for those of you who may not be too familiar with earthquakes. Then I'm going to turn my focus to Western Canada, uh, which is where I live and uh, where we have the most serious uh, earthquake hazard uh, problem in the entire country. It's not the only place that we have earthquakes in Canada, but uh, the seismic hazard is largest in the West on the Pacific Coast. I'm going to talk a little bit about the large historic earthquakes that we've had in this region. Um, talk about the different types of earthquakes because it turns out that we have three very different types of earthquakes that pose a threat to uh, our population, our population centers. And then uh, look at what the probability or the likelihood is of an earthquake in the near future. By near future, I mean the next several decades. Um, and then based on what we have seen from historic earthquakes in other places in the world, I will talk a little bit about what the likely impacts of such an earthquake, a damaging earthquake, would be to mainly Vancouver, but to the entire populated area in the Pacific Northwest. And I should add that this region that is susceptible to earthquakes has a population of about, I want to see about 8 million people. Um, 3 million in British Columbia, uh, about 4 or 5 million in Washington State, just south of the border in the United States. 
So that's where I'm gonna go with my presentation. And this may seem elementary to most people, but when I give a public lecture on earthquakes, I like to basically define what an earthquake is. And an earthquake is really the direct result of the sudden slip of two blocks of the Earth's crust, um, typically along faults. So earthquakes occur along pre-existing faults and the stress within the earth of the crust becomes elevated to the point where that weak plane provides a slip surface and the two blocks of the earth's crust slide maybe up and down, maybe horizontally, or typically some combination of the two, uh, creating the waves, yeah, well that's terrible, um, the waves that propagate out from the source of the earthquake, or the hypocenter, as we refer to it. The point on the Earth's surface directly above the source is referred to as the epicenter. That's a common term that's used in the media, is the epicenter of an earthquake. It's really the projected point up to the Earth's surface of where an earthquake occurs at depth. Earthquakes can occur in depths of hundreds of, meter, hundreds of meters, very shallow earthquakes, or they can occur at depths as much as about 300 kilometers in very special circumstances. Another important concept, of course, is this seismic energy that's propagated outward from the source is really a bundle of waveforms. It's not just a single type of energetic wave. And we typically refer to waves as either body waves that are propagated from the source up towards the surface. And those body waves are of two types, primary waves and shear waves. Primary waves being push-pull waves going like that or shear waves, which are the more damaging of the two, are sinuous kind of waves, like a snake-like form moving across the ground. These, of course, these types of waves, these shear waves, uh, put incredible stresses on structures, you know, on built structures. They, unlike, many structures are built to resist compressional and extensional energy movement, but these type of waves, where the motion is in a shear form, are typically the most damaging types of body waves. There are also seismic waves that reach the Earth's surface and then propagate at the surface, or very just below the surface. And uh, there are many types of these surface waves. Uh, the Love Wave and the Raleigh Wave are just two examples. Um, and they move along the surface of the Earth. So my point here is that typically an earthquake comprises waveforms of a variety of different types of energy. And um, that energy can depend a little bit on the geology of the area that being impacted. It can depend upon the distance from the source, the distance from the epicenter. It can depend on a wide variety of things. So in a sense, each earthquake is unique. There are no two earthquakes that are exactly the same. The magnitude scale. Canadians have a problem with this because all magnitude scales are logarithmic scales. They're scales that are nonlinear. And um, in fact, there are many different types of these logarithmic scales, but they all operate on the same principle that um, the energy release logarithmically provides a function of the number on the magnitude scale. Um, the original magnitude scale was designed by a, a geophysicist, a seismologist by the name of Charles Richter. It became known as the Richter scale. And seismologists no longer use that scale because it is a specialty scale designed for earthquakes in California. And also, it was designed based on technology and instruments that were, I would say, primitive compared to what we have today. 
So seismologists have developed other scales that provide a better measure of the amount of energy that an earthquake releases. And these are all logarithmic, meaning that as you go up, in terms of the energy release, you're going up not in a linear way, but in a log, an exponential way. So the energy release, uh, say as you go from magnitude four to five, is about 30 times. So magnitude five earthquake uh, has a, releases 30 times the energy of magnitude four. A magnitude six earthquake releases 30 times 30, or 900 times the energy release of a magnitude four. You can see that, of course, as you get up into these high magnitude ranges, the energy release is, is absolutely huge. And in fact, on Earth, slippage along faults cannot generate the energy equivalent of a magnitude 10 earthquake. The largest possible earthquake that we can get on this planet is about 9.5 or 9.6. We had one of those in Chile in 1960. Great Chilean earthquake was a magnitude 9.5 earthquake. I, in a way, I would have loved to have been there, in a way, I'm glad I did wasn't, because that was one big earthquake. And what I've done with this chart is show kind of equivalent energy releases to a number of historic earthquakes. And you'll notice Mexico City, 1985. That was a very large earthquake. It was a magnitude 8.1, I think. Um, and it was on the upper end of the magnitude scale, released a lot of energy, and of course had a huge impact on, on Mexico, which I'll talk a little bit about later. I'm sure most of you are very aware of that. So, the important thing is to remember that this scale is not a linear scale. It goes up and up and up. Energy release compounds upwards exponentially. And then finally, in terms of these basic earthquake uh, kind of information pieces, is this neat relationship that we see in given areas, such as, say, Mexico City, of the relationship between the number of earthquakes and their maximum magnitude. And this is what we refer to as the FM scale, or the frequency magnitude scale. And it's intuitive in the sense that larger earthquakes are less common than smaller earthquakes. There's actually something approaching a, uh, an arithmetic or a quantitative relationship between those two factors. Um, so here, on the vertical scale, we have the annual frequency, it's logarithmic scale here. So 10 to the one would be 10 earthquakes 10 earthquakes in this particular area, which is an area in the U.S., uh, occur with a magnitude in the about two plus range. So magnitude two earthquakes, they're not really felt earthquakes. We can record them with instruments, but we don't feel them. A large number of those small earthquakes. If we get out towards the end of this scale with documented events, we see that the annual frequency here is every 10 years, on average, every 10 years you get one earthquake that might be a magnitude 5. Magnitude 5 earthquakes are earthquakes, if you're close enough to the epicenter, can cause damage. Um, that's about the threshold of damage for earthquakes is magnitude 5. And the neat thing is this is a pretty tight relationship. If you do uh, statistical correlation of those two variants, magnitude and frequency, you see that it's, for a given area, it's a pretty, pretty tight relationship. And a relationship like this allows people to kind of probabilistically estimate what the likelihood in the future would be of a particular size to this way. It's, this is a unique set of data for one area. Data for another area might be quite different, but it would be a linear trend on a log-log plot. Western Canada, and I'm going to 
introduce that to you with um, what I'm sure you're aware of, because you live in the same kind of global environment that we do in Canada. We all live on what's referred to as the Pacific Ring of Fire. This is a zone of active recent volcanism, and it's the place where, uh, I wouldn't say most, but a lot of earthquakes occur. So each of those purple and red dots is the epicenter of an earthquake in the historical database. And those earthquakes are large, largest earthquake earthquakes. Um, they range up from magnitude 6.5. So this is a subset of all earthquakes. These are big earthquakes, damaging earthquakes. And you can see um, Mexico sits right there, Action Central, lots of earthquakes. I know you've experienced uh, a number of them in very recent time. Um, I guess I'm going to get somebody to know why I won't advance. Maybe the battery's going. And then we, up here in the Pacific Northwest, also live within that same Pacific Ring of Fire, an area of active volcanoes. We have our Cascade volcanoes, including Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens, and we have lots of earthquakes along our coast. So I'm going to turn here to this area to show you why we have earthquakes in this particular part of the world. Sorry. Okay, so that's focusing in on the Pacific Northwest. Here's Washington State, the British Columbia, we call this the Pacific Northwest. And um, off our coast, just off, and this is Vancouver Island, here's Vancouver, off our coast, we have a subduction zone. A subduction zone is a place where one plate, typically an oceanic plate, moves down beneath another. And I love living in Vancouver because we're right at the edge of one of the largest plates on Earth, the North America plate, beneath which this offshore plate, the Juan de Fuca plate, is moving down. It's moving down at a rate of about four centimeters something like that every year. We used to think it was moving down without any sort of barrier, without any friction. But now we know that's not the case. That oceanic plate is in fact stuck against the edge of North America, trying to go down at a rate of four centimeters per year, but unable to do it. That's a recipe for disaster in the long term. Interesting though, this is a small subducting plate. The Juan de Fuca plate is a very small oceanic plate relative to subducting plates off South America, off Latin America, off Japan. Very small, it's only 1,100 kilometers long from south to north. South of that subducting plate, we have the North America and Pacific plates moving horizontally against one another along the San Andreas Fault in California. Very different type of tectonic environment. We also have that situation off northern British Columbia. We have what I call San Andreas North off what we refer to as Haida Gwaii, that island at the top of that image. So you'll see in the next slide that most of our earthquakes are localized along those plate boundaries. And we're fortunate in British Columbia, to a lesser extent in Washington, in that those plate boundaries are offshore. They're off the west coast of North America. In contrast, in California, the San Andreas Fault just goes like a dagger right through the state. It goes right through the city of San Francisco. Um, its splay faults play out all through the San Jose, San Francisco area, um, where you have in California a population that's at risk of about 37 million people. It's the same as the population of my entire country, Canada. It's a heavily populated area at very high risk because there's a plate boundary that's on land as opposed to a plate boundary that's offshore. However, we're thanks so much. We're not uh, out of the woods here, because if we look at the historic record 
of earthquakes off our coast, and again, here's Washington, here's British Columbia, you can see the earthquakes that lie along the plate boundaries. The epicenters are offshore from, from Vancouver Island northward into Alaska. So we get big earthquakes offshore, and they can be felt in some of our smaller towns and cities, but they don't produce damage in this area. So what we have to worry about are this cluster of earthquakes that actually are not along the plate boundary. And I'll show you why they're not on the plate boundary in just a moment. They're actually uh, different types of earthquakes away from the plate boundary. And we have had, as I'll show you in a moment, a number of historic large earthquakes in the range of magnitude 6 to magnitude 7.5 um, that have caused a lot of damage all through this heavily populated coastal, coastal area. Two of them are a nice example. This is one that occurred, it's a long time ago now actually, uh, about over 70 years ago, 1946, which coincidentally was the year I was born, <laughs> um, happened on central Vancouver Island, uh, magnitude 7.3, Population of British Columbia at that time was a tiny little fraction of what it is today, um, but it still produced a lot of damage. The area shown in red is roughly the area of very heavy damage, and the area in yellow is areas where there was a small amount of damage, but it was strongly felt. And um, some of the damage indicators are shown in this slide. Um, and they're the result of secondary effects like liquefaction, landsliding, um, and well, ground shaking as well, the epicenter being right there. And this is an example of a more recent earthquake. It's the last kind of magnitude seven earthquake we've experienced in our populated Pacific Northwest. This is an earthquake that occurred just south of Seattle, produced two billion US dollars damage, a lot of damage. Fortunately, only one person was killed, um, but it did produce a lot of damage. Um, and you can see here, this is a magnitude 6.9 earthquake, that's a magnitude 7.3. They're drawn to the same scale. You can see that even though the magnitude differences are small, the footprint of the earthquakes are very different. And this gets back to the fact that this is a nonlinear magnitude scale. Very, very different amount of energies that are released by these two earthquakes. So based on historical data, um, our federal agency has produced maps that indicate probabilistically or in a probability manner what the likelihood of particular ground motions would be in the maximum future worst earthquake that we might experience. And so as this gets red and hotter, the ground shaking intensity increases. Seismologists typically use um, the acceleration due to gravity as a metric for that ground motion, where one would be the acceleration of an object just due to gravitational forces. And you don't want to be in an earthquake where the accelerations are one, very, very high rate of ground movement. Um, and you get down into these lesser magnitudes, but even down in here in these kind of greenish to yellow accelerations, you can have a lot of damage if you're close to the epicenter of the Earth. And you can see basically these high color zones mimic the earthquake epicenter map that I showed you a moment ago, with most of the really high ground motions associated with offshore earthquakes, and then you begin to get this zone close to our big cities, close to Vancouver, where we can expect fairly significant accelerations in the future during an earthquake. So I said I'd tell you what the types of earthquakes are, because our public tends to think that all earthquakes are one type, but they're definitely not. Um, so we have three types of earthquakes. We have earthquakes that occur in the brittle crust of North America, that's the plate that's being under, underridden by the offshore plate. 
we get earthquakes that typically are shallower, and it can be up to magnitude 7, even 7.5. And if we have one of those large earthquakes close to a city, we are going to have a disaster if we were to have an earthquake like that close into one of our cities. It's interesting that we get a second type of earthquake. They're actually more common than these crustal, shallow earthquakes. These are earthquakes that occur within that subducting plate, the plate that's going down beneath North America. And I'll show you why earthquakes occur at those greater depths in a moment. But you can see as this plate begins to die down, um, these earthquakes get deeper and deeper and deeper. So beneath our population centers, they're down around 40, 50 kilometers. And that's a saving grace because the energy has to travel from that source zone all the way up to the surface before it can impact infrastructure. So it's got to travel 40, 50 kilometers on the, at the get-go before it can do any damage. And all earthquakes attenuate, the energy of all earthquakes attenuate with distance from the source. That means the energy gets less and less and less away from the source. So as you're close to the source, you're going to feel the high kind of impact of the energy wave, energetic waves. If you're a long distance, either deep in the deep in the uh, lithosphere or distance, distant places from the source, you're going to experience lesser ground motions just due to attenuation. So here we'll start with these deep earthquakes. We call them slab earthquakes because they're, they occur within this subducting plate, this slab of oceanic basaltic lithosphere that's going down beneath North America. And in a profile drawn essentially midway through that diagram, at the top, you can see these earthquakes. Basically, each epicenter is shown as an orange dot. Um, and they clearly define that downgoing plate. And so say these can be fairly large earthquakes. We've had earthquakes up to magnitude seven that have occurred along that subducting slab beneath our big population centers. A 2001 earthquake down here is one example of that, which that occurred about 18 years ago. So that's one type of earthquake. And then the reason we get them in that slab is, well, there's two reasons. One is that the slab is getting uh, deformed as it goes down. It, it's not going down along a, a horizontal plane. It's, it's a warped plane. So as it goes down, it warps and creates tension within the still brittle subducting plate, which can lead to slippage along fractures and faults in that plate, which are what are responsible for the seismic energy release. The other reason is if you look, and those horizontal dashed lines are the depth down to that subducting plate. The plate is arched. We call this a Nisqually arch. It's actually subducting in a different direction beneath British Columbia than it is beneath Washington. It, the plate's getting kind of stretched as it goes down due to those different trajectories of the movement of the plates. For those two reasons, we get this cluster of moderate to large earthquakes, unfortunately beneath all our population centers. So that's kind of an issue that we face. Um, although they're deep, they do cause damage. I mentioned that the 2001 earthquake um, produced uh, two billion dollars damage, U.S. dollars. The second type of earthquakes, if I can just go back, are earthquakes within the crust. So these are the shallow earthquakes that are colored blue here. Um, and we have mapped and identified uh, smoking gun, I call them smoking gun, active faults that are capable of generating these crustal earthquakes. And they're shown here as red lines. Each of those has been shown geologically to have produced recent earthquakes. And by recent, I mean geologically recent, not recent in terms of historical time. So they have produced earthquakes within the past several thousand years. Typically, each of those faults is capable of producing one 
magnitude six or seven earthquakes every couple thousand years. And although we know where they are, we don't know their current stress state, so we actually are not able to predict when one of these might go and produce a magnitude six or seven earthquake. You can see that a lot of these actually converge on our capital city, Victoria. So I say all roads go to Rome and all the faults go to Victoria. This is just an example of an earthquake that occurred about 900 years ago um, off Seattle on that east-west trending fault that we call the Seattle Fault. And in this LIDAR image, which shows the direction the last ice sheets moved down Puget Sound, you can see the, the glacial form of those, that movement, the kind of shaping of the surface caused by the overriding glacier. And then you can see this little rip along the Seattle Fault that's a product of that earthquake about 900 years ago. And at this point on this island, Bainbridge Island, we see evidence that an offshore marine platform was elevated seven meters during that earthquake. Um, this was formerly a, a rock strat or a rock platform lying offshore that was elevated seven minutes and about 30 seconds, seven meters and about 30 seconds, 800 years ago. And that fault goes right beneath Seattle. So when this was discovered about 20 years ago, um, it really caught the attention of, of the emergency officials in Seattle, because it demonstrated for the first time that a very large, young earthquake uh, that would be capable of devastating the city had occurred uh, in the past. And then finally, the third type are the earthquakes that occurred due to the slip along the boundary between the two plates. And uh, these are called subduction zone earthquakes. And so what happens is strain is accumulating at the, the interface or the mega fault between these two plates. And eventually, because that offshore plate is trying to drive down at four centimeters per year in North America, that movement overcomes the strength of the rocks and the fault slips. And because it's such a large fault, you know, it has a width of 40 or 50 kilometers along which it is locked or kind of hung together um, and has a distance of 1,100 kilometers. You can get the largest earthquakes on Earth off our coast, kind of competing with Chile. Um, how do we know that uh, we're, in, we're due for one of these earthquakes? We use uh, differential GPS based on satellite platforms to continuously monitor ground stations that we can pinpoint with accuracy of millimeters. So we know that these stations on the surface of the Earth, that Victoria, Penticton, and other areas now, are stationary. They haven't been changed with each subsequent pass of a satellite. We can actually monitor the distances as they change between those two stations. And what's happening, if we look at the record, and that goes back 23 years, we see that the core of Vancouver Island is being elevated due to what's happening in depth due to the convergence of the plates and the fact they're hung up against one another at depth. And the distance between the stations, the outside stations like Victoria and the inland stations, is decreasing. So combination of those two patterns tells us that these plates are locked, that they're accumulating strain, and that at some time in the future, they're going to slip and have a magnitude eight to nine, perhaps even larger than nine earthquake off our coast. You can, in fact, from data of that sort, map out where these two plates are stuck against one another. They're not stuck inland because they get too hot, they can become less brittle, and so they can't retain the strain. So there's a zone that's many tens of kilometers wide where the two plates are stuck against one another. And this shows it here in this kind of brown pattern, is where we see strain accumulating 
based on that service evidence that we can infer from satellite and GPS technology. And I'm a geologist, so this is the stuff I love to do. I love to go out in the mud and find the geologic evidence for these past earthquakes. And the model that we have for our coast, for the outer coast of Vancouver Island and the Pacific coast for Washington State, is that during an earthquake, the land drops down. You know, the two plates slip. North America moves 15 to 20 meters, maybe, towards Japan. And the back side of the plate drops down, drops down in elevation. <coughs> so in our tidal marshes, we see the evidence of that. We see old soils that are now buried by tidal sediments that record the actual event itself. So here we have a paleo tidal marsh that's been dropped down during an earthquake, one to two meters, over abruptly overlain by tidal muds, which have accumulated on the space created by that down dropping. And interestingly, between the two, in many places we get tsunami deposits because as this earthquake occurs, tsunamis are generated. So tsunamis come in, carry sand inland, and deposit these bedded sand deposits at the interface between the drown dropped marsh and the overlying tidal marsh. In some places we can see recurrent events. So think of this as a very prominent marker. And when we step back and look at our tidal marshes, we can actually see recurrent events. This is not something that just happened once. In this particular exposure, we see evidence of five of these big magnitude eight to nine earthquakes over the past 3,000 years or so. And we have other proxies for these big earthquakes um, that have allowed us to extend our record of these earthquakes back 10,000 years. We have evidence for 20 of these earthquakes over the past 10,000 years. The average interval between them is 500 years. But you can see from this diagram, each of these bars represents one earthquake. They're not uniformly spaced. They seem to be clustered. They occur in clusters of perhaps five or three to five cluster uh, events per cluster, depending on what sort of uh, statistical technique you want to apply to the data. We do know that the most recent one occurred in January of 1700, January 26th of 1700. We even know the hour that it occurred. It occurred at 9 p.m. You might wonder how we know that, because there was no written records from that time, except in Japan. And Japan recorded the tsunami that was produced by the earthquake off our coast, off the west coast of North America, that had run-ups of up to five meters in the coastal zone of uh, Honshu and produced a lot of damage, so it was recorded. And one can back calculate the time it takes for the tsunami to actually travel across the ocean. And you end up with an event that occurred at 9 p.m. on January 26, 1700. So we're 320 years out from the last of those big earthquakes. We're getting closer to the next one. But because these events appear to be clustered, we're not sure whether we're within a cluster or between a cluster. It's not very satisfying in that, in that sense. Oops. So just in summary, we've got these three types of earthquakes, subduction zone earthquakes, uh, slab earthquakes, deep earthquakes, and crustal earthquakes. And we can estimate their maximum size from the historical record and from geolo geologic evidence. And we can estimate the recurrence and this for this region, for northern Washington and southern British Columbia, we come up with recurrence intervals as shown in this map. And you can see that the smaller uh, crustal and deeper earthquakes are really the ones that we almost worry more about because are more likely to happen than this rare big magnitude number. So I'd just like to finish up with uh, talking a little bit about what some of the effects of these different types of earthquakes are likely to be. And again, we use as a kind of a metric 
uh, recent historical earthquakes. For example, the Tohoku earthquake in Japan, the great earthquake that occurred some years ago. We use the Christchurch earthquake, which is a much smaller earthquake, but a very, very damaging event, to tell us what we're likely to experience. So fire, ground rupture, surface rupture, ground shaking, kind of the iconic uh, phenomenon of earthquake. Ground motion amplification, tsunamis, liquefaction, landslides, and aftershocks. That's a kind of a, a list of the bad things that can happen in an earthquake. Um, fire, we're in a better, better world now than we were in 1906 when San Francisco was gutted by a huge wildfire because the city was a, basically a wood construction city with buildings close to one another. But even in recent earthquakes, you typically get fire from broken gas lines, uh, from wood frame houses that become ignited and burned. So fire is an issue that we worry about and should worry about in any, any built-up area, in any urban area. We still have to worry about fire. It may not destroy the whole city, but it can cause a lot of damage and injury. Uh, ground rupture. Uh, Many earthquakes, particularly the shallow earthquakes, actually displace the ground surface. And in California, they've got legislation that requires that people not build within a, an envelope of a distance from a known active fault. They have a very good catalog of active faults, and they won't allow uh, infrastructure to be built within a zone around the active fault because of the possibility that the ground might actually rupture. It's not related so much to the shaking, it's related to the actual displacement of the ground surface. Um, iconic ground shaking, you know, and I've talked a little bit about the different types of seismic energy that can cause damage of this sort. Um, ground shaking depends upon magnitude, it depends upon geology, it depends upon distance from the source, it depends on many things. Um, Typically, seismologists look at earthquakes in terms of the bundle of energy, the actual energy that is captured within this symphony of different types of ground motion. And here we have a magnitude scale. We have the period of the waveform. So is it a, a short period or a long period? You're getting up into very long, uh, low amplitude waves at that end of the scale and then the velocity of the ground. So you can see you can plot in three-dimensional space the bundle of energy that a particular earthquake has, and they all are unique. But what you see in this diagram is that magnitude six and seven earthquakes have the highest spectral velocity, the highest ground velocities when the periods are short. So this is the type of thing that you experience when you hardly can stand up in an earthquake. The ground is shaking so much you can want to sit down on the ground kind of intuitive, but you can see how it kind of breaks away as you go to longer waveforms and to smaller magnitudes. So seismologists look at earthquake energy in three dimensions, four dimensions if you include time. It's important. And then geology is important. This is a kind of a crude map of where I live, and you've got the bedrock mountains to the north. You've got this very thick fill of quaternary sediments, these loose sediments that impact seismic energy as the wave is the waves pass through it, that in fact can alter the velocities and the accelerations by a factor of four or five times by the time the energy impacts infrastructure in an urban environment in this area. So geology and topography, we notice the main historic earthquakes like the Haiti earthquake that uh, structures built on steep slopes, on ridges, are mo mo more vulnerable to damage than structures built on low relief surfaces. So my university sits on a mountain and in fact is much more likely to be damaged than structures that are built at the base of the mountain in that regard. Uh, ground motion amplification. Soils, depending upon their thickness and their properties, uh, can actually de-amplify or amplify the acceleration of the waves. And um, we are aware of this because amplification can impact structures of different size. Um, 
as I'm sure you are all, all aware, uh, this became very evident after the 1985 earthquake in Mexico, which is kind of the type of earthquake we would expect. It was a subduction zone earthquake. But Mexico City was, I think, almost 200 kilometers, at least 100 kilometers away from the source. And the energy passing through Mexico City was this attenuated, uh, low amplitude, long wavelength energy that made the ground roll like a ship at sea. And as a result, it was amplified in buildings of a particular height. And that was catastrophic because those buildings failed under that amplified energy. People on the ground would have only felt this rolling motion. It would have been unsettling, but it's not what you typically expect during an earthquake. It's a rolling type of motion. So a lot of old Spanish structures were totally undamaged by that earthquake. Low, low height buildings. But these 10 to 20 story buildings began to uh, sort of rotate, bend, and eventually fail, and resulted in a horrific loss of life. Uh, tsunami. Big subduction zone earthquakes um, trigger tsunamis because the ocean floor along the coast is displaced upward or downward by the movement of the two plates. So that sets in motion another type of waves. These are waves, body waves in the ocean or body waves in water that uh, eventually reach the coast and amplify and rush inland uh, is what we know of tsunami. So that's a picture of a resort in Thailand as uh, the tsunami in the Indian Ocean was arriving about, uh, I want to say, 15 years ago now. And we've been, we haven't experienced really a damaging tsunami in, in our big cities, but we can model those tsunamis. We can do numerical models that tell us how long it will take. This is a series of eight snapshots through time. Um, five minutes after the earthquake occurs, 11, 23, 43, 110. And you can see how the energy propagates in red colors or large waves. Uh, blue colors are lower than normal. Waves are the, the flip side of the high waves. And we live right in here. So fortunately in Vancouver, which is along the coast of the inland sea, we're, we're really at much less risk of tsunamis than you would be if you lived in a place like Tofino on the outer coast of Vancouver Island. Um, the waves, when they reach Vancouver, are typically going to be one to two meters high. It's not, it's going to cause some damage, but it's not catastrophic. And they arrive three hours after the earthquake, so people can actually protect themselves, they can evacuate low-lying areas, they can get their boats and ships out into the open, open deep of water where they won't be damaged. Um, and this is a map that I produced that kind of shows, in a very subjective way, the likely amplitude of tsunamis um, with respective runoff. So up to 15 meters on the outer coast, which is very close to the zone where the, the plates slide over one another. And then as you go inland past Victoria, you, you get in an area of intermediate tsunami runoffs. And then in the inland sea in the Strait of Georgia, you have much lower, lower waves. So that's a kind of something we've done to inform public officials that they don't have as much to worry about from tsunamis as they might think. And liquefaction, we learned a lot from the Christchurch earthquake. Um, liquefaction is a very infrastructure damaging phenomenon. Um, it results from the uh, shaking of, of water rich granular soils, sands and silts in particular, that occur at shallow depths. So they're not overly consolidated, they're at shallow depths. And as they're shaken, they actually transform from a solid into a liquid. And the overlying, more brittle material, if it's present as it was in Christchurch, um, extends, breaks, cracks, settles irregularly, destroys buried utility lines like sewer lines, water lines, gas lines, totally knocks them out, and can produce surface manifestations in the form of sand volcanoes. So this is an area in Christchurch after 
the 2011 earthquake where there had been extensive uh, liquefaction with shallow subsurface layers. You can see these, they're called sand volcanoes or sand boils that uh, result from the expulsion of liquefied sediment from depth onto the surface. And we've mapped out areas in the Metro Vancouver area that are highly susceptible to liquefaction. So one of these areas is Richmond, which is home to 250,000 people. If you've ever flown into Vancouver, you fly into an airport that's located on this surface right here, the Vancouver International Airport. Um, the higher ground around these low-lying areas is much less susceptible to liquefaction. And of course, the bedrock areas that are shown in brown here will, under no circumstances, look um, This is Richmond, a kind of a uh, satellite image, the great photo looking off towards um, Vancouver, which is right up in here. So Richmond is located here on the Fraser Delta. So this is the area where you expect that to occur. We also expect it around our shorelines where we had uh, artificial fill placed to extend the land for development. Um, artificial fill is in this False Creek area uh, is highly vulnerable to liquefaction as well. And then finally, landslides. Uh, we live in a geography in Vancouver um, that is highly prone to landslides. A lot of relief. Um, a lot of opportunities, even without earthquakes, of having rock falls and rock slides. Um, these are problems when they occur individually. Even a small rock fall on a highway can block a highway for days, for a day or two. But you can imagine if you have an earthquake in areas like this, you might in fact totally disrupt our ground-based infrastructure, our highways, our power lines. They're all located in these deep valleys within our mountain environment. Um, the phrase the Trans-Canada Highway runs north, Highway 1. Um, highways, other highways in the interior also are in deep mountain valleys. And finally, uh, the highway north to Whistler, our famous ski resort, is in a narrow mountain corridor. And I just show you examples of that. So this is a photo looking along Highway 99 heading north towards Whistler, which would be off to the left. And you can see how steep the slopes are. Cut slopes, highly vulnerable to landsliding in the Fraser Canyon. Um, we, we're aware that this could be a major, a major disruptor in the event of an earthquake in the metro Vancouver area in terms of getting relief, emergency supplies in to the city. And then finally, something that most people don't think about are aftershocks, because most big earthquakes have aftershock sequences. And a classic example were the two earthquakes that occurred in New Zealand. Um, a main shock in September of 2010, outside the city. So Christchurch is located right here. This was the larger of these two earthquakes. It produced a a big aftershock sequence, but it didn't produce as much damage as a smaller earthquake that was only in, had an epicenter seven kilometers from the city center of Christchurch. And that smaller earthquake killed 181 people and caused 20 billion uh, US dollars damage. Magnitude 6.3, that was an eye opener to me because it tells us that what we seismologists think of as a moderate earthquake, if it's close enough into an urban area, it can produce such a large amount of damage. But it wasn't over when it was over. It wasn't over after that earthquake. There were something of the order of 17,000 aftershocks in the days and months that followed that earthquake. Some of them, even up to a year after the earthquake, were damaging events. They actually were large enough that they exacerbated and made worse the damage of the original earthquake. So emergency officials have to not only worry about getting past the main of them, they've got to worry about this almost countless number of aftershocks that occur after that. For in rare cases, such as the shallow New Zealand earthquake, can occur for years after, after an event. It's a big problem. So I think I'm going to end there. I kind of used all my available time, so happy to answer any questions you might have.
And don't be shy if your English is not good. I have a couple of questions on how these um, cross-pull airbags are related to the other kind of airbags. I mean, if uh, faults are activated during, uh, for instance, on this lava, or just uh, work air, you know, I mean, independently, independently, the faults are yeah, and they're necessarily related to such a Well, that's, that's a very good question. Um, some of them may be uh, related. If we get a big subduction zone earthquake, it might trigger motion on a crustal fault. But uh, many of them probably are totally independent. And uh, I didn't go into it, but uh, uh, the North American plate itself is broken up into a series of subplates. And it turns out that uh, there's a block that uh, encompasses the entire Pacific Northwest that is kind of rotating around. It's moving in a clockwise manner, uh, very, very slowly um, around a pivot point farther into the continent. And uh, so it looks like most of those active faults, I had a, a kind of cartoon that showed where those faults were. They're east-west trending, northwest trending. They're probably a product of strain related to this kind of rotation. Um, and they typically are uh, strike slip faults with a thrust component, which is consistent with that right, right lateral strike slip faults with a thrust component. So kind of a long answer to your question. I think it's possible we could get them accompanying big thrust earthquakes, but I think they can occur independently. The, the chronology we have on these active faults is kind of crude. It's based on carbon dating. Um, but it's, it doesn't suggest that they're linked necessarily to the bigger quakes, the magnitude 9 quakes. Okay. So, mm. uh, my other question was, uh, this kind of part is not really related to, to this area. We were sure it's but um, according to the current knowledge on uh, earthquake occurrence, on the history of Earth, um, is there any evidence that in the past, I mean, millions of years, when chronic air plate movement initiated, earthquakes were occurring more frequent, um, they have higher intensity than right now, or is just that? Uh, uh, that's a, another good question. We don't kind of have good chronologies on really ancient earthquakes, um, but there's some, in my part of the world, we've had this big ice sheets that have covered uh, the land, and these ice sheets actually have deformed the crust. They, they've uh, depressed the crust hundreds of meters, and uh, when these ice sheets disappeared about uh, 15 to 10,000 years ago, there are people that have suggested that that rapid unloading that's actually triggering triggering uh, a lot more and in more intense earthquakes. Mm -hmm. But again, that's kind of hypothetical because we don't really have very good chronologies for those sorts of associations. Um, it's more kind of what you might expect, but did it happen? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I was asking this because I, I, I don't know, in the morning we were talking about landslides and deep sea of landslides, big landslides. Uh, because of the number of uh, big landslides, uh, the evidence yeah. of big landslides occurring in southern Mexico, yeah. there are many, many, I mean, yeah. dozens, which is, uh, right, right now we don't see this, this the yeah. landslides to go. Oh, yeah. So uh, I wonder if uh, in the past they were more, uh, this, this, the earthquake were stretched stronger and more frequent than right now, yeah. and then produce it or trigger it. Yeah. Bigger than actually, I think it's time. it's possible that you know you get times when you get a clustering of earthquakes mm -hmm. where you get multiple earthquakes that are very large, uh, one triggering another, and uh, you have kind of uh, periods when you have higher uh, levels of seismicity. Mm -hmm. um, I worry about this because in the Pacific Northwest, our last big earthquake was 18 years ago, it's 2001, we haven't had one in this region. And to me, that's unusual. 
that you look even in our short historical record and they're more frequent than that. So it's kind of odd that we have this little gap here. And does that mean we're in for a period in the future where we might have a higher level of seismicity? Um, you know, I believe that can happen in Europe. Some of the big landslides in Europe that happened like eight or 9,000 years ago seem to be, uh, they're big, they're gigantic, and they seem to have all occurred within a fairly narrow window of time. And people have said, well, maybe that's climate. But, you know, it wasn't a time when climate would typically produce a lot of landslide activity. So I think a lot of researchers feel there was a, either one or a series of big earthquakes that occurred in Western Europe, um, you know, eight or 9,000 years ago that they haven't seen since, you know. I have a question that is actually not really covered through your presentation. It's about how the city of Vancouver is using the information that you generate to prepare, you know, the, the, how it's affecting the preparedness of the city. Yeah. Our, kind of our, uh, the types of efforts that are uh, initiated due to better knowledge of science are captured at the federal and the provincial level. So Vancouver um, is, you know, a jurisdiction within a provincial jurisdiction called British Columbia. And British Columbia is one of the 10 provinces of Canada. And we have what's referred to as a national building code. It's a federal uh, code, which Mexico has as well. Um, something, in fact, the two countries have very similar provisions in their seismic, seismic provisions in their building codes that require uh, for public infrastructure, so this is not for you know, a small wood frame house, but for big buildings, um, airports, hospitals, things like that. They have to be built to withstand what's kind of a very high, uh, very unusually large earthquake. Maybe not the largest, it's typically one that might occur every 2,500 years. Um, so it's fairly conservative, um, and those provisions then are adopted by the British Columbia government and then our developers and engineers are required to follow those guidelines. So it's all good down to that level. And then the question is, well, do the builders actually follow those rules? And that may be a whole nother question. <laughs> I don't know. We like to think that our recent building, our recent built infrastructures are capable of uh, withstanding, you know, a fairly large earthquake. We'd like to think that, but we've uh, never really been tested in, uh, unlike, you know, California or Japan, we haven't been tested yet. So that's a problem because I always feel that actually experiencing, seeing what happens to built infrastructure and earthquake can tell you a lot about what you have to do in the future. Um, and the other thing I would add to that is that the seismic provisions are designed to prevent injury and loss of life. That are entirely uh, built on that premise that you want to ensure that people aren't killed in an earthquake. Um, they don't tell you anything about how the building is going to look after the earthquake, only that it will still be standing. But if it's severely damaged, as we saw in Christchurch, um, it has to be torn down and rebuilt. So our building codes don't address the economic issues of earthquakes, they address the public safety issues. And I think it's high time that for new buildings we begin to look at the economic implications. And that's not being done to a great extent. You know, there are very cool technologies, basal isolation, that can protect a big building from damage. Um, it costs more, so there's a trade-off between, you know, the additional cost and uh, the actual cost of replacing a structure if an earthquake happens, but I think that, I, I'm biased, of course, but I think that we need to pay more attention to the economic consequences of earthquakes, because we've seen Mexico, you know, Japan, um, all these re areas that have experienced recent earthquakes, what the cost of these things is just astronomical. You know, 
on many of these places, including Christchurch, have never totally recovered in terms of the economic impacts. So. Are there any vulnerability problems based on the data, earthquake data? I mean, the three types of earthquakes produce different kind of damage, as I can imagine. Are there vulnerabilities on this particular video vision which depict this kind of potential damages to population, to infrastructure, to yeah, the human yeah we're, we're beginning to do that now. We've kind of adopted the uh, U.S. Uh, FEMA um, requirements. You know, they have a hazardous model which kind of looks at potential scenario damage from earthquakes. You got to be careful because uh, engineering uh, guidelines in the U.S. are different from Canada, so really we ought to be adopting our own hazardous model, um, which I think we're beginning to do. But there have been some vulnerability studies done. Um, I don't know, you know, personally, I think that it's, uh, they, they help us better understand, but they're probably got a lot of uncertainty, you know, as to what would actually happen. But it's my own personal view, I think. Um, we've inventoried, uh, well, I haven't, but God knows I haven't. But uh, earthquake engineers have inventoried about 100,000 buildings in the metro Vancouver area um, to kind of look at how they were built, um, you know, what sort of potential damage might, might result. Well, thanks. You, you have talked with us in those uh, 45 minutes. Yeah. Uh, well, I, was, I was wondering how long you've been studying this thing in order to have this kind of output? Oh, uh, well, I'm just one little piece of a puzzle here. So I'm really summarizing what uh, uh, a large number of uh, seismologists and geologists and geophysicists have done for over 30 years. Typically, this work goes back to efforts that were made in the early 1980s. Um, and it's been a huge effort uh, driven on both sides of the world. So I'd say 30 years, you know, involving probably 40 or 50 scientists. A big effort. We've made more effort on this than we have on any other geological problem that we face. No, but the problem is also by the geological, sorry, Yeah, some of this work is being driven by the federal uh, Geological Survey of Canada. Some of it's driven by uh, academics um, in you know kind of universities scattered through the region, and uh, some of the uh, more applied work is being done by uh, by consultancies, by private sector firms as well. So it's it really is an integrated effort. Mm, I'll let you know if there's any model that you could use to know if the if a uh, system if the seismic activity is increased or decreased by the distance by the the, uh -huh. the distance from the yep. the epicenter mm -hmm. you mean or distance in time distance, uh, no, um, distance in time yes uh, there are we refer to as ground continuation models that um, are partly based on we say empirical data, they're based on data that have been collected in other earthquakes, you know, as to how the seismic energy uh, changes with distance from the source. Um, so built into um, seismic building codes are partly attenuation models. You know, the attenuation models help you determine what the ground velocities and the ground accelerations will be at particular distances. Mm -hmm. And as I said, that depends on a lot of factors. But there are actual uh, computer-based models that will estimate, you know, ground motion velocities. I don't know about, you know, because different waveforms attenuate with different rates, and I don't know if that's kind of been built into these models. I think it probably has. And the primary waves travel really fast, and the, the shear waves, secondary waves travel much slower. 
Um, Jurys are more damaging. Um, you know how they actually perform the attenuations on those different types of waves. I'm not sure. I'm actually a geologist. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to ask you um, if you have considered uh, measurements of the repression for the secondary effect like the tsunami, because in the, the scenario for a tsunami, tsunami like in Japan or in yeah. Malaysia, tsunami was the most destructive yeah. effect. Yeah. Then I don't really know how uh, much uh, population is in the Vancouver ah. Island, but uh, yeah. in the shape that it has, sometimes yeah. increase the, the effect of the tsunami. Yeah, uh, Fort, we're, we're very lucky because uh, our largest populations are, are inland, you know, they're around the Strait of Georgia. But we have, you know, some communities that are at high risk, um, that are right on the, the Pacific coast. Um, Tofino, you include it, uh, Fort Alberti. Uh, the total population is very small. Um, you know, of those at-risk communities, you're talking about maybe 5,000 people. It's a small number. That's not to say that um, you know the government hasn't uh, uh, kind of focused on those communities. Um, I think it's actually interesting, because I mentioned that uh, small waves, one to two meter waves, can be quite damaging. Um, not so much for the height of the waves, but the velocities. And uh, we have these, you know, I would say probably billions of dollars of boats that are parked on the coastline, you know, recreational boats, and I understand they're very expensive, um, that would be probably damaged by even a small, fast-moving wave. So I've been trying to alert, you know, our inland cities that they can't ignore, even though the waves aren't going to be catastrophic, they're not going to kill people. Um, they could cause a lot of damage, and just from uh, docks and wharves and boats and things like that. In the outer coast, they've got a totally different strategy. You know, there's a warning system that uh, provides uh, warning in theory that a tsunami is going to arrive very quickly. And people are told that they feel very strong ground motions in these outer communities for several minutes, that they should immediately go to higher ground. And the communities have identified uh, 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 evacuation points where people should go. Um, and we, we were tested once, we had a test once, and people did kind of react okay, but some people did and some people didn't. And so we got work to do there as well. You betcha. El Centro de Investigaciones en Geografía Ambiental, en el marco del seminario Alexander von Humboldt, otorga la presente constancia a John Clay por su participación en el seminario con la conferencia Earthquake Hazards en Risk, en Risk on Canada's West Coast, impartida en Morelia, Michoacán, el 11 de noviembre de 2019. Firma el director, doctor José Antonio Vieira Medrano. Muchas gracias. Y... Thank <laughs> you.